Welcome to Bear Necessities, your official Coventry Bears podcast. We live at CoventryBears.com or wherever you normally get your audio. And it is an absolute pleasure to be back with you. I'm one of your hosts, Dave Musson, and joining me as ever is my co-pilot and former Bears fullback, Craig Cathcart. Craig, how are you? I'm good, mate. I'm good. It's been a lovely Easter weekend. I'm surrounded here by Easter eggs. Uh, spent most of the weekend in the sun. And uh, I keep saying this, but we're getting closer and closer to the rugby league season starting. We are as well. And I even saw on Facebook a little reminder that it was this weekend in 2015 that the Bears started their League One adventure as well with that, yeah. that game. I don't know if you were there against Oxford, really wet and windy, horrible game that the Bears won. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's amazing how much how much progress they've made in such a short space of time. Yeah. Um, so this is another pre-season episode for you all. And our plan is to, well, we'll, we'll chat for a little bit about you know, rugby league, um, some rugby league that we've seen so far this season. We'll try and bring you up to speed on general bears happenings and, you know, just sort of stay in touch. But um, before we start yakking, let's get right to this episode's main event. We were very lucky to be joined by the bears head coach, Rich Squires for a pre-season check-in. And um, yeah, this is what he had to say. Um, so Rich, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. It's uh, it's great to have you here and be talking pre-season. I mean, first things off, you guys are actually in pre-season now. Um, it must be good to be back. Yeah, it's very good to be back. Um, I think tomorrow's session will be, we'll be back, being a back a month, um, which has flown by. Um, but yeah, it was really good to get back and kind of all the boys to come back together and see faces that have only been seen via camera for, you know, a good number of months. But yeah, we're, everyone's excited to get back into it and hopefully that's the last time we, we have to kind of go behind closed doors and work from home. So what does what does training actually look like now? Because I'm guessing like a couple of years ago, pre-season training would be players arrive, they get changed, they warm up, they do the training and then maybe hang out for a bit afterwards. Like, tell me, tell me what the process is to get through and finish and complete a training session. In yeah, it's very times. different now. <laughs> yeah, very different. Um, there's a lot of planning that goes into it uh, and that's all linked in with obviously the Grace who's heading the physio team Ryan the team manager um, so it kind of looks everyone kind of gets assigned a, a time to arrive mm-hmm. um, so everybody has to arrive at a designated time uh, when they arrive they have to stay in the car until uh, they get uh, assigned to go up to our testing base uh, we have four people who are testing for us um, once you arrive you go in there you get tested uh, all in a one-way system uh, and then once you've been tested it's back into your car um, then we have to wait half an hour to get the either positive or negative um, kind of score back uh, if it's negative then everyone's out and you can kind of go get changed and head down to the field but it's kind of more structured so we've got people staggering and arriving at different times um, so we're doing it on a Saturday morning with everybody getting tested that day it allows us to do a lot of contact um, you know, without kind of any questions. Um, and then from there, really, it's, you know, down into designated different sections. So everything's kind of got to be set up before the boys start. Um, and we split up into, you know, different groups. Boys are all bibbed up, um, you know, and everything's got to be filmed as well. So it's, it, you can only do blocks of 15 minutes of contact. Right. Um so you kind of we've kind of got to limit what we do. And we're allowed to do so many blocks. So it's kind of planning with myself and Dave to find out what we want to get done for that session. Yeah. Um, and then you know, kind of work it in and where we can. <laughs> so it goes very quickly. Does that fifteen minutes? Yeah, I bet. And it it sounds like it's. I'm, I'm guessing it's obviously you sort of limited on contact time. Is it is it affecting how much time you're being able to spend on things like set plays as well and sort of you know, talking tactics, because I'm guessing the boys are pretty fit. They've, they've been doing a good job of keeping themselves fit, but it's that that match sharpness and that that team link up that you you really need to get from these sessions, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, we have come back in quite good shape, um, which is good, which is something you always worry about. Are the boys actually doing what they're, <laughs> are they doing what it says on the tin? You know, <laughs> but they've all come back in great shape. Um, but we, we are doing a lot of structure. We're trying to kind of get our partnerships together within the groups. So our left edge or our right edge will be kind of in a group together. So they so they get to know each other and kind of know how each other work. Uh, but when it comes to structure, we're kind of, we are throwing that in there. Um, 
in kind of a game situation. Some of it with no contact, uh, some of it with contact, but it's always different going against a, a defensive line in front of you. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's hard to adjust that way when you're actually limited to the amount you can do and, you know, we get a kind of switching people in and out. So it's we've got to be careful if we're switching the groups or the pods we've got. So there's a lot of, a lot of planning going into it and sometimes you can get carried away. <laughs> Yeah. So so with all that in taken into account then, like looking at it from your your perspective of, of head coach, how how is your squad looking as we as we count down this final month to the season? Yeah, we're looking very good. Um, you know, some people have shown up really well. Uh, and some everyone across the board I think is that excited to get back into it. Um that everyone's kind of pushing for it for a shirt. Sometimes pushing a little bit too much. Um you know, a little bit too eager, um, which can sometimes make things more difficult because everybody kind of wants the ball. They haven't been there for, you know, six or eight months. Everybody wants the ball. Everybody wants to make a tackle. So we end up like headless chickens at some point, but that was only for the first couple of weeks and we're starting to, to really pull together and, and string together some nice stuff, which which is good. And it's always, you know, it's always good when the boys are actually seeing it as well. Um, yeah. You know, when you finish... You can tell when you've had a good session, um, you know, when the smiles on faces. Uh, and we've got a really good group this year. Um, yeah. it's, and we've had a really good month so far. Uh, the weather's been really nice to us as well. So it's been a nice, glorious day. We've had, we're extending our Saturday sessions. So it's kind of a, a full half day from. So they're right. spending quite a bit of time together every Saturday. But yeah, we're looking really good. Um, so we've just got to keep going in the right direction now, moving down to. You know, it's it's not long until that first game. No, no, and and uh, a bit of a cheeky question this, but how's your how's your assistant looking? Is he is he pushing for a for a place on the on the starting thirteen? <laughs> He's looking good. Um, yeah. We didn't recognise him until two weeks ago. He went for a complete lockdown haircut to having a fresh fade. So oh wow. Um, but yeah, he's, he's going well, and he's, he's he's starting to show his qualities that he has off the field as well as on it. Yeah. Um, you know, just being able to kind of sit back a little bit and. You know, let him lead and just watching the boys kind of take it in. Um, and, it, and it's a quite a young group still with some in, inexperience mixed in with the experience. So it's kind of good where Dave's leading from the front, as well as our leadership group, uh, the likes yeah. of Liam Wellham, as well as really standing up. And, you know, the boys are really buying into what they're saying, um, which makes my job a hell of a lot easier. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, there's a lot of trust in there that kind of, it was quite tough last year, um, but it's you know, like a different ball game this year. So you mentioned where you know that first game is is fast approaching, and actually that the first month of the season. I mean, you look at the fixtures: Barrow, West Wales, London Scholars, and Rochdale. You know, so looking at it purely on paper, you'd look at that and think, okay, there's there's probably two games there that the team would be would be targeting as as what one wants to get wins out of the West Wales and London game, and then arguably the two favourites for the league. I mean, what what are your thoughts on that as an opening month of the season? It, it, it's quite a tough month. Um, you know, you, you, like you said, the likes of Barrow and Rochdale are the, a tip for the two at the top. Uh, and for me, I'm not, I'm quite happy to get Barrow the first game, if I'm honest. Um, yeah. Now, although they'll have played the Challenge Cup, um, with them losing to all of them, they'll have played a game and then they kind of got a break. So that they are in the same boat of us. Um, so I'm hoping we can try and catch them cold, and especially on the 4G pitch mm. um, when the rule change, it kind of could suit us yeah. uh, with, with the style of play that we're going for. Because you know Barrow like to bully teams, um, you know, and they're a real physical outfit with some with some skill around that as well. Um, so we just got to try and match that physicality, and then kind of play the game we want to play. Um, but like you said, with Scholars and West Wales, they're kind of two games we are targeting. Um, I thought West Wales showed it really well against Witness in the Challenge Cup. Um, just the speed of the game, and I think a full time opposition took its toll in the end. Yeah. Um, and then Scott Scholars are a little bit of an unknown. They've kind of gone under the radar. Um, nothing's kind of being said about them, so we don't know what to expect. And then Rochdale have kind of broadcasted what they want to do, you know, with some big signings and bringing a couple more in next week. So it's going to be a tough first month, but. You know, the boys are kind of know where they want to be and we kind of get set ourselves some targets. Um, and the targets this year that the guys have set within the club and within the 13 without even me and Dave being in there uh, are very high expectations. So 
there's, there's a, a belief amongst the group that we can pull off some upsets. Yeah. Um, and that's what we're kind of we're looking to do to start start the month as we can and kick on from there. And with the way the the end of season stuff is panning out, I mean, you know, if you get in that top six, you're in with a chance of of promotion. Do do you think top six is a, is a realistic aim for the Bears this year? Yeah, I don't see why not. Um, you know, every kind of everybody's in the same boat. Um, we've had so long off, and I think it's however people adapt to the rule changes and adapt to kind of looking after each other best. Um, mm. I think the team that picks up the least injuries um, and can can try and get some consistency together will be the top six. Yeah. Um, and I think everybody will be beating everybody. Um, there'll be shocks every single week. Uh, I don't think there are many kind of blow away scores. So yeah, there's there's no reason why we can't push that top six. And you know the, the boys know that, uh, and we've said all along from the beginning of the preseason where we're not we're not coming to kind of make the numbers up anymore. Yeah. Um, you know it's quite it's quite funny on social media where you look at things where people are putting league predictions in, and I saw one where they've done like a I think it was from a bookmakers, and they they put um they put the odds in, and we weren't even on there. They screenshotted it, completely missed it off the bottom. Um, <laughs> You know, but that kind of stuff just, just you just feed it into them. You know, the boys kind of thrive off that kind of stuff, and they know we're not going to get any respect. So it's ours to, to be earned and kind of put ourselves on the map. And I think we've got a, a group that are prepared to do that this year. Yeah, yeah. And and just lastly, um, bit of a bit of a question to put you on the spot, but I'm always curious, particularly at this point in the season, and because we. You know, we it's been such a long off season. Fans are going to be excited about the new year and and maybe some new faces or, or just just people who are really showing up in training. If I, if I forced you to give me a name for a Bears player to watch this year that that fans should be keeping an eye on and getting excited about, who, who would you pick? Me? We've got a couple. Um, no, I, I always say this because we have got we have got a couple. And I can't probably pick out one. Uh, the first one probably is Dan Coates. Mm-hmm. Um, a young halfback who, who come down from Newcastle Thunderers in the university system who is is really starting to show his maturity during training um, and we've kind of when I spoke to him before about coming down he's, he's got an opportunity to, to kind of grab a team by his horns and direct it the way he wants to play um, you know he didn't get the chances he wanted up at Newcastle um, and he's got a lot of respect from people around the league one and he could go a long way. Um, I think all he needs is one, you know, consistent season, um, you know, to show what he can do. And I think clubs will be sniffing around him. Um, but there's no reason why he can't be, you know, super league potential within the next few years. Yeah. Uh, and the same with Jed Charlton. He's another one who's come down. Who's, he's picked up a little bit of a knock in pre-season with his wrist. But for, for his age, it's just the maturity he's got and shown around the, you know, with the group. Of, of picking people up and leading us around the park and he's a real physical threat uh, you know and the, Newcastle's becoming a little bit of a hotbed now uh, and they're producing some real talent and these boys have been in their system for a good long while um, so they've played together together um, you know for a good few years and I'm hoping they can kind of strike a partnership up uh, and really kick us on uh, there's one under the radar that we haven't really announced yet <laughs> Um <laughs> So we've got somebody who's transitioning in from rugby union, okay. um, you know, who has been playing full time rugby union, and who's transitioning to us to kind of kick on for the World Cup at the end of the season. Who he'll turn some heads. Um, he's new to the game, so still learning it, but he's a big boy, and you know, he's prepared to put everything on the line. So he'll be someone who I think will impress, and he's already got a few clubs, you know, in the championship and Super League looking around him. So. He'll be one to look out for. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, it's it's really exciting to to feel like the season is actually actually coming down upon us, and uh, we can we can look forward to seeing the Bears get out on the field for the first time in an awful long time. Rich, good luck for the year. I'm sure we'll speak to you before the season starts. But thanks for joining us on the pod, and um, yeah, good luck for the rest of preseason training. No problem, Dave. Thank you. So huge thanks to Rich for joining us and filling us in on how the Bears' preseason preparations are going. Craig, it was, it was really great to hear Rich saying what good shape the squad is in. And like you said at the top of the show, it's it's starting to actually feel like the season is really on the horizon now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, well, um, the Bears' uh, social media people will have seen there's been lots of photos from training sessions and it's starting to feel really real now. Um 
you can see in those photos that the squad looks very together. There's lots of smiles, um, but also a lot of serious work going on, and uh, it's really ramping up now. Uh, they had some sessions before Christmas. There was obviously a break due to due to lockdown, but uh, yeah, it's looking really, really good. And uh, everything I'm hearing from from the camp is that there's a lot of togetherness, a lot of people very determined to um, really push on this season and, and put the Bears right up there in terms of uh, going for playoff positions. So there is a lot of confidence, and it really feels like there's a lot of momentum even before the season started. So that's really, really positive. Yeah, yeah. What what really struck me in that interview was just the practicalities of how much work it is to to purely to set up a training session. And I think it really is testament to just everyone at the club that they've been able to put together such a slick machine and, and, and get things moving and get, get those training se- sessions happening, isn't it? It's, it's absolutely crazy. I mean, the Bears are a small club, um, you know, small club but very professional about everything that they do and for the coaching team for Alan for the players for everyone to come together and uh, and and make this such a slick operation to get training going really does say a lot um you know I think um you know as I said I'll happily admit that the Bears are a small small team but the level of professionalism um, you know, is right up there with any team uh, in rugby league. I think it's it's fantastic that they've uh, not only managed to keep the morale for the players up through lockdown, but also start training on time. Um, you know, get everyone down to training and get everyone training, get all the testing done. It's such a big operation, isn't it? Mm. You know, mm. it takes so much organisation. It's uh, it's just crazy to think what clubs have to go through now to just to even get a training session happening. So it's a real testament to everyone involved that that's gone so smoothly. Now, I know, I'm sure from your playing days, you probably hated pre-season training. I don't think there are many players who do enjoy pre-season training. Obviously, this year is massively different it really you know you get the sense that the the guys themselves have been able to keep themselves fit so that that kind of shock of having to do fitness in pre-season is probably not there for them and as Rich was saying that they are finally being able to work on contact and set plays and stuff it feels to me like the biggest challenge for the club this year is is really going to be like match sharpness and getting those on-field combinations to click do you think that sounds fair for this this particular pre-season yeah, well, I think you've seen it at the start of Super League. Um, you know, there is ring rustiness. Um, mm. There's been a lot of mistakes in, in some of the games. Um, there's new rules to think about. Um, and also, um, you know, there has been quite a large number of injuries as well. So that is something to think about. And the other thing to say as well is that tiredness seems to creep in late on in games. Um, you know, after 60 minutes, teams teams have started to tire a bit. Um, So, you know, that's going to be a feature definitely in the early weeks. Um, And it's going to be very hard mentally as well for players um, because you build up a mental resilience as well as a physical, uh, you know, physical fitness. Um, To mentally play week in, week out takes a lot of preparation um, and a lot of thinking about and players have to be up for the game and that's going to be tough for them having gone from, not been playing for a year or two, suddenly thinking it's a match day coming up and I've got to try and perform and I'm going to be playing um, potentially in front of cameras when the fans come back, all those sorts of things are going to be tricky to deal with. And, um, you know, again, a lot of the stuff that I'm hearing coming out of the camp is that the um, everyone involved in the coaching setup has, has thought that through. They're, you know, people are very, very positive about what's to come. So, uh, it feels like they're very, very well prepared for all of that. I think that that point you made there as well about going from not playing for a year to playing week in, week out. And we know this season because of because of the late yeah. start and it's still got to be finished in time for the World Cup. You know, it's it's we are going to get the kind of season that we were almost crying out for in 2019. You know, it is going to be basically back to back. Once the season starts, that's it until September, really. So it, yeah. it, it's it is a very different challenge, isn't it? It really does. It, you just as I think, as Rich was saying in his interview, 
you know, you, people are going to be beating people every week pure, purely because of the unknowns of this whole season. It really, I mean, it was going to be a competitive year in League One anyway, but it really does feel like it's, you just don't know what's going to happen week in, week out, do you? Well, you've seen it already in uh, the Premier League in football. Mm. seen some really unpredictable results. Some players uh, respond differently to playing behind closed doors. Uh, some players have coped better with uh, with lockdown and not playing and everything else, teams get injuries. You know that all those sorts of things will happen once the League One starts, and it will add some unpredictability. Um, I, I would imagine, particularly in the early weeks of the season, um, you know there will be teams caught cold. I guess um, either because uh, their preparation hasn't been right, player fitness is an issue, or um, just because they get surprised by a team that, um, because there's been such a long break as well, um, there hasn't been as much, I guess, there's not as much knowledge about different teams and what sort of setup they're going to have and how they're going to play and everything else. It's going to be definitely in the early weeks, there's going to be some interesting results. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what do you, do you make of Rich's picks for, for his players to watch? I mean, to me, it sounds like, sounds like we've got some pretty exciting options in the backs, especially the halves this year. It's, um, I'm, I'm very intrigued to see how they settle in. Yeah, they're young players, but players who've got a lot of rugby league experience. And I guess um, we've had some good halfbacks over the years, but... I don't think we've truly had a really great halfback partnership. Um, and it would be really good to get a partnership going in there that, that can run the show, um, you know, where both sides of the field, we've got options. Um, you know, that would be really, really good. And I think you've got two uh, young, hungry players who, who really want to give it a good go and want to prove, prove themselves in League One. So that's really, really exciting. Really exciting. Mm. Well. Really, really good stuff from Rich. And um, thanks again for him to, to him for joining us. And I know we'll definitely get him back on the show before the season starts for a proper Just preview. One, um, I was going to say as well about, I don't think he mentioned the guy's name, but uh, we have an Irish prop coming in mm. um, who I believe has played inter- interprovincial rugby in Ireland uh, for Connors. Could be wrong on this, but uh, he looks a really exciting prospect. And to think that we could have two Irish props, him and Peter Ryan playing together um, is really, really exciting. And um, potential World Cup places at stake as well. Yes. Um, You know, that's, uh, you know, and obviously we've got a Scottish international as well and Dave Scott. So uh, in in theory, we could have a handful of players going to the World Cup, maybe more. Yeah. I mean, Kadeem's involved in the Jamaica squad, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's really exciting stuff. We, uh, I do genuinely think we've got a really, really good squad this year. And, and that um, that Irish prop you're talking about, he's the one that that um, Al sent us the photo of. He's the the absolute machine, isn't he? Yeah, he's been in a few of the photographs, preseason photographs, and um, yeah, I think he's going to rip it up in League One. I, you know, based on what I've been hearing, he, he sounds like he could be a very good player. Nice. Nice. It's uh, yeah, it is really exciting. Um, and as I say, yeah, so thanks so much to Rich for for coming on the show and giving us that that sneak peek of how the squad's shaping up. And like I said, we'll, we'll get him on again before the season starts for a, a final season preview. Um, I guess before we uh, we sign off for this particular episode, I think there's a, there's a few bits and pieces we should round up to do with the club, um, and maybe just touch a little bit on how we feel the League One sides that have. Um, had a bit of action in the Challenge Cup again on as well. But let's start off with some rounding up of the news. So Tritag Rugby has been able to get going again in the region this week. And the club has also revealed details of the three satellite clubs it's going to be setting up as part of that uh, World Cup legacy programme. Um, so these are, are junior clubs um, with a couple being created in Coventry and one in Birmingham. I mean, Craig, I, I sort of lump these two together because, you know, I feel like they're, they're two absolutely terrific pieces of news, you know, the Tritag rugby coming back and the satellite clubs. And I think they're worth grouping together because, you know, they just form part of this bigger picture of really underlining what amazing value the Bears are bringing to the sport of rugby league and to the region and and the sport as it tries to grow, doesn't it? And these these are two incredibly positive pieces of news that we should really be shouting about. 
Yeah, I mean, firstly, on the fly tag, I played my first game last week. Uh, it was brilliant to be back after three months of not playing. Mm-hmm. Um, now, try tag in Coventry and Warwickshire has just gone from strength to strength. Um, there's now over 300 people playing on a weekly basis. Uh, they've, they're doing taster sessions in Stratford uh, upon Avon, with I guess with a view to setting up a league there. Um, we've previously had a league in Solihull as well, mm. and the standard is improving all the time. And to have, you know, over 300 people playing uh, a variation of rugby league every week is just absolutely phenomenal. Not only that, it's, you know, it's, it's boosting, um, you know, things like the, the fact that the Bears have got links to this. This is, all, this is all good for the Bears, but it's all good for the overall game as well to have mm-hmm. people involved in rugby league and having access to things, you know, um, through t- tri-tag rugby, there's access to things like, uh, I think there was tickets to the Challenge Cup last year, was it? Goodbye yeah. through yeah. playing on that. Um, you know, it's just phenomenal. And, and there's people uh, coming in and playing who've never played rugby before. Um, playing tri tag rugby with, I mean, the team that I play in is a real mix of people. There's ex rugby league players, ex rugby union players. There's players who've never played rugby, uh, or mixed teams, male and female. So it's a really, really uh, brilliant thing to see when you turn up and you see four or five games all going on at once. Um, it's just phenomenal. Um, I, I love it. I think it's it's a real growth area for the sport. Uh, I think. A lot of people are put off trying rugby league because of the contact element of it and the physicality. With tri tag, you don't have any of that, and the basic skill sets are the same. You know, you you have five tackles, you play the ball. Um, you know, it's obviously a small seven aside. It's it's on a smaller pitch, but you have set plays. You have all sorts of stuff going on, which uh, you know, which which really reminds me anyway of playing actual rugby. Um, so it's just brilliant. Um, I mean, on the other um, point that you're making around the satellite clubs, I mean, that's just brilliant news for the region, I think. Uh, you know, the Bears have always had a junior set up. They get, I think they, the last, obviously we, over the last year, it's been held back due to COVID and not being able, they weren't able to play last year. But uh, I think the last time they had junior sessions, they had over 100 kids every week. Um, the problem has always been in, for, for kids in the, in the Midlands is getting games. Yeah. Um, now, they have juniors festivals uh, where a number of teams get together. Um, and sometimes uh, clubs have joined forces to play games against other, you know, other teams but they've not been able to get regular games. Uh, and these are young kids who want to play, you know, as much as they love the training and going and, and developing their game, they want to be playing matches as well. So to have three satellite clubs set up is just brilliant. And, um, you know, to see that as well in conjunction with some of the work that Alan has done um, with Midlands Rugby League, helping them out with their website and, and getting all the clubs uh, in the Midlands listed on there. Uh, to see all the good work that's going on within other clubs in the Midlands as well with their junior setups. I mean, it's really positive, I think. And, you know, to have three satellite clubs potentially playing around Robin games against each other throughout the year, for example, that would just be brilliant. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and to get more people involved in the game, more volunteers, uh, more young kids, more parents. Um, all of this is widening the footprint of rugby league. Yeah. So, it's all brilliant, brilliant news. I mean, I've I've had a bit of a bee in my bonnet this last week or so. Well, a bit longer than that, the last couple of last couple of months, <laughs> because there's a lot of criticism out there for clubs like the Bears. Um, there are people within the game, including some journalists who are fairly high profile in the game. I won't mention any names, who you know are of the view that clubs like Coventry or um, other expansion clubs don't offer very much to the game. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Mm. Um, what we've just spoken about for the last five minutes is stuff that the Bears bring to the game. And it's only a start. They've only been in League One for five years. 
This is a, a young club still finding its feet that's developing and progressing every single year. Yep. It's, you know, doing more and more stuff for the game to, to establish roots in Coventry. It's the World Cup's coming here this year as well to, to the Rico Arena. You know, the, all of this stuff adds value to the game and it does it at a significantly lower cost than, you know, and I don't want this to be a slinging match about Super League clubs, but you look at the central funding that Super League clubs and you look at the very, very small amount of central funding that someone like the Bears gets and who's adding the most value. You know, that's, you know, it really annoys me when people start saying, oh, the only way we can, you know, if there's a lower TV deal, the only way to save money is to cut funding from League One clubs, particularly and uh, particularly um, clubs like the Bears, because expansion clubs, unfortunately, are always on the lips of people uh, when they talk about these things. Yeah. You know, and I hope, I would hope that the game as a whole can come together and support everyone. There's room for everyone in this game, and and actually, the sport itself will not progress unless there is expansion. And clubs like Coventry and West Wales and others are supported to grow and develop and, and do it in a sustainable way. Um, you know, so that's my two penneth on that. Uh, I've had to get it off my chest because it's been winding me up, particularly on social media. <laughs> so, so um, you know, and, you know, to be able to talk through sort of the, the stuff around the, the junior clubs and the tri-tag rugby, you know, I felt like I had to say it. Yeah. Um, and I will continue to argue the points uh, on social media and uh, on other sources about the value added to the game by, uh, you know, so-called expansion clubs who do it on a very low budget, um, but bring real value to the game. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And um, yeah, and I think the, these little bits of news are only are only the start. It feels like this season's going to be going to be one for lots of positive news for, for yeah. the Bears, for the region, for for the sport in the Midlands as a whole. Um, yeah, so I agree with you wholeheartedly. Obviously, um, but yeah, very well said. Um, I guess one other thing to mention. I think we covered it last time, but I will throw it in again here in case we didn't. Um, the Bears are playing a preseason friendly away to Keithley on Saturday, twenty fourth of April. So a couple of weeks before the season starts, which will obviously be a very useful test as they start getting that match fitness that we talked about earlier. But um, yeah, I don't think we need to discuss that. I'm just making sure we covered it because I can't remember if we said it for sure last time. But um, we are almost done. But um, I guess Craig, before we go, I just wanted to briefly touch on some of the rugby league you've already seen this season and, and just wonder if any player or team has caught your eye. I mean, I was, I've not, I've not seen loads, but I was very pleased to see um, the Broncos York cup tie um, from last week where we had, you yeah. know, those, those three ex bears players in Jason Bass, Sam Davis and Jacob Jones all in the starting lineup. And as we were just talking about, like, I mean, Jacob Jones guy from just outside Birmingham. So playing rugby league in the Midlands has you know, use the Bears really well to showcase what he's about and is doing brilliantly in that Broncos setup now. And and again, really sure sort of shows that value of having the Bears as part of the pathway in the game. Um, yeah. And from the sounds of it, I think the League One clubs all put up a pretty decent fight in the Challenge Cup, even though they all lost. I mean, was there anything you wanted to throw in? I know we can't we can't really make too much of a judgment call on Gavin Henson, for example, and Rangi Chase, just based on one game against Witness. But um, and anything that particularly caught your eye? Um, I think, uh, yeah, I was going to mention um, how great it was to see uh, Jason Bass, and Sam Davis, Jacob Jones um, playing in that game. It's been fantastic, actually, to see Jacob Jones hold his place in the starting lineup mm. and play the game this weekend. Um, you know, he's a real talented player. We could see that when he was at the Bears. Um, he was phenomenal. He was up for a young player of the year in League One. Um, and as you said, this is the pathway. Uh, teams like the Bears give players a pathway. They give them opportunities. And to see a Birmingham lad like Jacob Jones uh, make it at Broncos and be playing regularly um, is, is fantastic. Um, but when you look across... All of, league, all of the championship and uh, Super League games, I, I should say, I think there's a real theme emerging of young players coming in uh, and taking their opportunities. Um, there's other players who've played at the Bears. Joe Cater um, looks like a phenomenal player, but we knew that, uh, you know, he only played a handful of games at the Bears, but 
we could see straight away he was a phenomenal player. Yeah. Um, there's loads of young players coming through that just need an opportunity to get into the game. Uh, and the Bears are offering that to them. Um, in terms of the Super League start of the season, I've been, I have to say, as a fan of a League One club, I always approach the start of Super League with a bit of indifference. I'm not actually that excited about the league starting, but as soon as the games start, I'm just in there straight away. I think I've watched every single game on Sky so far. So, yeah. uh, and they've all been great games. Um, you know, there's been a couple of low outs, but a lot of the games have been very close, particularly for the first 60 minutes or so. Mm. And um, I think it's going to be quite an exciting um, t- league this year. I think there's probably three or four teams that are in the shot of winning it. Uh, I wouldn't read too much into results this early on in the season, but, you know, the usual suspects look quite strong. Yep. Uh, championship has been phenomenal so far. Um, mm. It really does look like there's... Um, between the top and the bottom, it's, it's quite close uh, in terms of squads. Um, but again, it's it's a bit early to call, but it's all exciting stuff. Um, it's just brilliant to see uh, Rugby League back on the TV. And I can't wait for the one season now. It's, yeah. uh, it's very exciting to have that just around the corner. Definitely. And it's only a few weeks away now. Well, um, yeah. Okay. That's great. I mean, let's, let's leave it there for this episode. I think we'll yeah. be back again, probably in a couple of weeks to continue counting down the start, uh, counting down to that start of the season. Um, if you enjoy the show, do go ahead and leave us a nice five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts and uh, tell your rugby league friends about it too. Otherwise, thank you to you guys for listening. Thanks again to Rich for joining us earlier. And obviously Craig, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure as always. I'll catch you soon. Yeah. Brilliant, mate. Thank you.